chapter 48. <clears throat> chapter 48, we're going to cover hazardous materials. Um, I will start by saying that <clears throat> uh, this is by no means a extensive hazardous materials um, primer. Um, you are supposed to have met the uh, standards and competencies of the hazardous materials awareness level. Um, if you have not done that, I will remind you that um, at least the Iowa Western students are required to uh, have on file documentation showing that they have uh, successfully met those requirements prior to being approved to take the National Registry. Um, this is a, a, a national education standard thing. Um, each individual institution uh, can apply this a little differently in which way they do this, but um, uh, you need to have that uh, documentation on file that you have at least met those requirements. There's a, a shortened online version of it um, by uh, I, my recommendation. Uh, if you get the opportunity to take more hazardous materials training, you should do so. And in many departments are now uh, requiring their, their personnel to have hazardous materials operations level. Um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Homeland Security, um, has basically mandated that all emergency responders, fire, EMS, and law enforcement, um, have minimal, uh, minimum training in uh, the incident command system as well as hazardous materials awareness. Um, also, if you've not read and studied the chapter, please do so uh, as soon as possible. Simply listening and watching the lecture is no replacement to uh, reading and studying um, this information on your own. So the education standard here, the advanced EMT applies knowledge and operational roles and responsibilities to ensure patient, public, and personnel safety. Um, the objectives for this chapter are on 1045 and 1046 in the text. All right, hazardous materials, often abbreviated hazmat, um, are different substances, whether they be solids, liquids, gases, capable of harming people, property, and the environment. Um, and injury is often through explosion, fire, release of a vapor, direct contact, or contamination of the environment. There are many, many different things that are hazardous materials. Sometimes um, it actually matters how much of it or a certain concentration of it before it becomes um, a major issue. Um, we know that any drug, uh, really any substance, uh, can has the potential to cause harm to the body, <coughs> including things such as water um, and uh, oxygen to the human body. But um, these are things that are usually much more volatile than those. <coughs> In many cases, when we're dealing with a hazardous materials incident, we're also dealing with a multiple casualty incident, um, unless um, it is something that may that we've been called out as a more of a precaution than anything. Um, so sometimes we're simply there backing up fire and uh, hazmat as opposed to actually getting called to an incident in which somebody has been exposed. Uh, this, <clears throat> the incident command system um, is strongly encouraged to be used in a situation that you're dealing with a hazmat situation. So the incident command system helps give structure to this incident. And this most likely is going to be an extended incident for you. Um, I can think of a situation <clears throat> earlier in my career in which responded out to a hazardous materials incident, sat on scene for about eight hours in the middle of the summer trying to determine what this liquid was leaking from this truck. And it was a fairly drawn out operation, of course, um, and come to find out in the long run uh, that it was paint dishwashing liquid that was leaking out of this truck. <clears throat> Nonetheless, when they started out, this was a truck that carried hundreds of different chemicals on it, so they didn't really truly know what they were dealing with. Only highly trained hazmat personnel can enter these areas of release, and of course they're going to need to wear special protective gear. There's various levels of protective gear that they're going to wear, of course. Um, and that is going to still be um, a, uh, a extended uh, 
an additional amount of training to learn these various different types of, of protective gear and uh, of course handling them. <coughs> In many cases um, the operations level uh, responders or the, the, the lower levels of responders are really going to be involved with probably a little bit of decontamination and isolation of the incident. So getting patients decontaminated so they can be cared for. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of times early on in the process that's really what we're, we're up to um, is uh, various hazardous materials personnel will go in, get the victims and patients, get them decontaminated and then out to us so we can then uh, provide the medical care that they need. So there's various uh, levels of providers of EMS or similar to our structure of EMS providers where we've got EMR, EMT, AMT, and paramedic. Uh, the very basic level is the awareness level, hazardous materials awareness. Um, and the awareness level, I, I, I can give you an even shorter version of what they have here, but those who witness incidents involving hazardous materials are able to recognize the situation, take measures to protect themselves, others, and request resources. Basically, hazardous materials awareness is to identify isolate, and when I say isolate, I mean keeping other people out and getting additional people there that know what to do with it. That's really all awareness is. So as an AEMT, <coughs> in most cases, our role is going to be patient care once they've been decontaminated. Again, much like when we talked in the rescue chapter, um, we aren't really into the operations phase of this. Our role is medical care. So you may be in a department or in a setting in which you have to be uh, multi-role, and that's, of course, that's fine, um, but you're going to require additional education in order to do those other things. Um, you must have an understanding of the types of hazmat and the problems that they cause. We don't always have all of the answers, but a lot of times we can gain enough basic information that we can start to um, prepare for and treat patients um, as they come to us. It goes with your case study. All right, so initial recognition and response, industrial centers, military bases, transportation incidents have the highest likelihood of large quantities of hazardous materials. However, it's not the only ones that we deal with. Uh, transportation incidents are probably the ones that we deal with the most, um, but we're also very likely here in the Midwest to have agricultural issues. And, and you may want to classify that as industrial, but I, I don't um, because uh, we may be talking smaller scale on a, on a local family farm. Uh, could very easily be a fairly, fairly significant hazardous materials incident. So, and they use a, mnem a mnemonic called RAIN. Uh, in our initial recognition pattern here. So RAIN is recognize, avoid, isolate, and notify. So basically this is saying, oh, I'm pulling up on this. This doesn't look good. I'm going to stay out of it. I'm going to try to keep everybody else out of it. And I'm going to get somebody else here to take care of it. That's really what this is all about. So <coughs> hazardous materials awareness is not even really truly um, a level that goes in and tries to even stop uh, the spread of it. So you need to be an operations level or even higher than that in order to go in there and start putting down things like dikes and dams and uh, uh, absorbance and whatnot. <laughs> so when we're recognizing a hazmat incident, most of these incidents take place in a fixed location. However, there are going to be situations in which it is mobile. Um, usually it stops being mobile uh, once somebody recognizes it. The situation I talked about earlier with the, the dish soap, um, somebody had followed a truck for a short uh, ways seeing this liquid dripping out of the back of the truck. <coughs> they were able to uh, flag the truck to get over to the side of the road, inform them what was going on. The truck moved off to a parking area uh, and it was able to be isolated into that. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, able to be isolated at one specific uh, location. Um, 
course you're going to be performing a scene size up. Uh, there's a rule of thumb when it comes to hazmat, and I, you know what? It's it's pretty stinking um, spot on. Uh, the rule of thumb is if you, uh, as an EMS provider, are pulling up on the scene and you can't stick your arm out at arm's length and cover the whole scene up with your thumb, you're probably too close. You probably need to move yourself back from that situation. Now, each situation will be different. Each situation uh, really dependent on the substance or the suspected substances involved will dictate a specific um, hot zone, warm zone, and cold zone in which we want to be found in the cold zone or even outside the cold zone. Potential sites for exposure for hazmat occasionally are also clandestine. Um, here in the, uh, the Great Plains uh, in the Midwest, uh, methamphetamine and clandestine labs are very, very popular. Sometimes these are things that people are carrying around in a backpack or the trunk of their car or uh, particularly they like the hotel rooms to go into hotel rooms, set up their lab there, leave the mess behind. So, <clears throat> and incidents, of course, can occur during transportation. <coughs> Things to know. Know your community. What do you have as potential uh, problems in your community? And uh, in some situations, uh, hopefully, as a emergency response, board or crew or whatever um, agency, you're all working together with fire, with law enforcement, with hazmat teams, with uh, departments of transportation and whatnot to identify some of these hazards. You know, so are you talking, you know, an agricultural center? Are you talking a manufacturing center? Places um, that use refrigeration have um, hazardous materials. People who have liquid oxygen, such as your hospital, have the potential for a hazardous materials incident. So a lot of places, fire is very good at doing pre-incident planning. So in, in many cases, they get in contact with these various uh, agencies and say, OK, what do you have going on? Uh, what do you have on scene? Where is it? So should we need to respond? We know the safer zones and the and they're not so safe zones. Hopefully, people are getting a general idea of the substances involved. So we're talking about pesticides, herbicides. We're talking specific chemicals of one way, shape, or form. Um, do we have <coughs> oxidizers, acids, corrosives? Um, do we have things that are maybe even a little, little bit more wicked, like nuclear um, or uh, biohazard? So having an idea of what there is history of prior hazmat incidents in your area. So if it's happened once, there's probably a pretty good chance it could happen again in your area. So um, if you're bored someday, I would encourage you to get a copy of what we call the Orange Book. Everybody should be familiar with that. It's the North American Emergency Response Guide, um, the NERG it sometimes gets called. But the North American Emergency Response Guide uh, is supposed to be in every emergency vehicle uh, in North America. Um, and take that North American Emergency Response Guide and go sit down next to a, a busy intersection and or train track in your community and kind of look at those placards that are coming through. And uh, you might be a bit surprised some of the stuff that rolls through your community. <coughs> All right, so this gives us a, a whoops, uh, shows us a picture of an overturned chemical tanker truck. I, I think some of the importance of this is you would potentially be called out for a vehicle collision or, or an overturned semi or something like that. The thing that you got to keep in mind is as you're approaching, you have to consider all those potential hazards. They probably didn't call up and say, oh, well, it's a chemical tanker that has flipped over and has leaked all over the place. So you're probably not going to have the full picture. And you have to keep in mind, even before you ever get on scene, what is it that we're potentially dealing with here. <clears throat> now, to roll up on something like this, you would be concerned, of course, because you have a large 
large vehicle that's tipped over here and leaking, but you're not going to have as many early warning signs on something like this. We don't see any plume of uh, vapors um, coming up here. There's no smoke or anything coming off of this. So, you know, we may not initially be as concerned, but of course, as we start to approach it and we see what this type of vehicle is, that might be an indication that us as an ambulance should probably keep back. Um, we don't need to go rushing in there to make sure that, uh, you know, this is or is not um, something that law, that fire should probably be geared up for as they're rolling in. So once you're on scene, be extremely cautious. <clears throat> it happens fairly frequently in which people uh, respond out to an incident and there is a secondary, tertiary, quaternary incident that occurs um, that, you know, things catch on fire, they blow up things under pressure give off, there's vapors, etc. <coughs> Avoid the hazard. Do not risk your personal safety to obtain information. Really, the, the tools you need for this job are your North American Emergency Response Guide or some other electronic resource, <coughs> in which I think a lot of services are going that way now, and a pair of binoculars. So you can stand back, um, or actually should say sit back, and, uh, and look and try to determine what is going on there. Examine the overall scene. Never drive through a hazard or attempt to get closer. Um, if it sounds like it's hazardous, stay out until fire and uh, the appropriate personnel get in there and start to uh, uh, determine, okay, we're good. We don't have people going down. So. <clears throat> as we're uh, approaching the scene or as we're sitting waiting to determine what's going on <clears throat> and the safety, Note things such as the color of any smoke, any particulates, vapors, flames, um, is uh, fluid running in any particular area, and be prepared to leave the structure uh, or the incident, the area immediately. Uh, if things get hairy, you need to be ready to get out of there. <clears throat> so what indications of a potential hazardous materials incident? So potentials, smokes, vapors, fumes, Particulates, dust, fire, leaking liquids, unusual sounds such as hissing, rumbling, or tearing of metal, uh, the presence of placards, or the, the uh, presence of uh, whether we're talking the DOT placard or the NFPA placarding system, which are both uh, shown on uh, 1048, 1049 in your text. <coughs> unusual odors multiple patients. Multiple patients should be a big, big red flag. If you're called for multiple patients that are down, it should be a big red flag. This is potentially a hazmat situation. An example of the NFPA 704 placard. Um, you, hopefully you guys are somewhat familiar for, with this from science class because uh, a lot of the chemicals in your science labs were labeled with the same sort of uh, uh, concept here, the NFPA placard system basically helps you determine how uh, ugly of a chemical is this. Uh, there are four major categories. Um, red is flammability, yellow is reactivity, blue is health, <coughs> and white being any specific hazards. It would be numbered anything from one up through four. Uh, four is uh, severe, and one is low level. So. Uh, something that would be a health hazard of four, basically they're saying this is deadly. So, fire hazards, it shows various flashpoints, reactivity, uh, whether it's very stable or if it's uh, uh, potential to detonate. <clears throat> and then those specific hazards such as, does it, uh, is it an oxidizer, is it acid, is it alkali, is it corrosive, uh, use no water, that's a big one, the W with a slash through it, use no water. Um, <clears throat> and radiation. So, uh, this is usually seen in smaller containers, maybe barrels, maybe um, boxes or bottles. Uh, occasionally they are also seen uh, on like doors of buildings that store these things. <coughs> now if you're talking something that may be on the entrance to a building, uh, you perhaps are only seeing you know, kind of a, a the worst case scenario. <clears throat> so it's not going to identify each individual uh, chemical that, that is potentially involved here. 
So the placards can contain various coded information to help us identify uh, the kind of material involved and what our immediate action should be. Um, so we can also draw our attention uh, <coughs> beyond the 704 uh, mechanism here. Uh, and in a moment, we'll talk about the DOT placarding system. So this gives us basic information. Uh, again, this recaps what I said. Uh, the, the diamond is the quadrant. Red, yellow, and blue. Red flammability. Yellow reactivity. Blue health effects. White other information. One is low risk. Four is highest risk. So the DOT placarding system. <coughs> Um, this is used, uh, helps us identify uh, the International Hazard Classification System, and it's a placarding diamond that you'll see on, uh, you see it all the time on semi-trucks, uh, but occasionally uh, other vehicles such as uh, trains, um, and then occasionally even in uh, uh, water transport. So um, this will use this gives us some information about the nine uh, major classes <coughs> of chemicals that we may run into. Now you can kind of see some of these um, if you're looking at the placards on 1049. You start to see things such as oxidizers. So if you look uh, on the right side, second row there, oxidizers, uh, they listed as 5.1, 5.2. Well, that tells you, five tells you that it's an oxidizer class. Um, we see explosives as being class one. Um, class two are things such as gases. Uh, three, flammable liquids. And so on and so forth. So div class one explosives, so they further break it down now to use this chart, um, which you can also find in your text on 1050. So the class one explosives division, one one explosives with mass explosion hazard, two with explosives with a protection hazard, explosives with a predominantly fire hazard, explosives with no significant blast hazard, uh, very insensitive explosives and blasting agents, uh, and then extremely insensitive uh, detonating articles. So it's basically telling us, you know, going from the most dangerous explosives down to the least dangerous explosives. Um, class two, the gases, whether they're flammable, non-flammable, non-toxic, compressed, gases toxic by inhalation, and corrosive gases. So this is very three or four, I'm sorry, four different um, subcategories of the of the gases. Class three, flammable, flammable and con combustible liquids. Class four is the flammable solids, uh, some of these being spontaneously combustible, and some of them are dangerous when wet. So 4-1 is flammable solids, 4-2 uh, spontaneously combustible materials, 4-3 dangerous when wet. So you put water on those trying, trying to protect and you may actually end up with a fire. Class 5 are the oxidizers, so whether we're talking uh, specific oxidizers or organic peroxides. Uh, class 6, toxic materials and infectious substances. Seven is radioactive, eight is corrosives, nine miscellaneous dangerous goods. So miscellaneous dangerous goods, environmentally hazardous substances, and then dangerous wastes. <laughs> so, uh, I would encourage you, if you haven't looked at the North American Emergency Response Guide, to look that up. Um, the North American Emergency Response Guide has got a lot of great information in it. <clears throat> this goes back over the classes that we mentioned. All right, so recognizing things, the United Nations identification number <coughs> uh, is a unique identifier for each hazardous chemical. However, uh, when we're talking emergency response guide, we may not actually be getting the specifics. More times than not, we're actually getting um, generalities. So it's telling us more about the family or the class of the chemical, not uh, exactly what it is. So now the North American Emergency Response Guidebook, or the ERG, um, like I said, it's supposed to be in every um, emergency vehicle in North America. And it has several sections in it. 
um, a kind of a general uh, section in the front that's white, kind of gives you the kind of the basics of identification. Then it has a yellow section on which it identifies chemicals by number. So you would see a number in a placard. Uh, we'll take, for example, um, let's see what I got here. Uh, 1565 barium cyanide. So, and then it also tells me next to that it says use guide number 157. So then you would flip to the orange section of the book where it has um, the orange pages. You would find 157, and then on 157 guide 157, it tells you the potential hazards <coughs> of health, fire, explosion. Uh, talks about public safety, talks about how far to um, evacuate people, it tells you to stay upwind, uh, stay out of low areas, ventilate well, what protective clothing to wear, talks about how to treat it if it's a fire, um, what to do in case you have a spill or a leak, and then has first aid list. So it will then tell us, you know, give artificial respiration, do not use mouth to mouth, uh, administer oxygen if breathing is difficult. Um, you know, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now it also has um, a blue section in the book, and the blue section is actually if we have the name of the chemical that we're dealing with, we can then look it up alphabetically in the blue section of the book and find uh, whichever the name of the chemical is, it will tell us the guide number and it will then tell us the ID number. So it's kind of the reverse of the yellow section. And then the final thing that we have uh, our final section of the book uh, is the green section which really talks about isolation. So it gives us the various uh, guides, the various ID numbers and then tells us how far uh, and for which size of spill we may be dealing with. All right. So North American Emergency Response Guidebook, I recommend everybody uh, at least break that back out and look at it. Uh, once or twice. Material safety data sheets. <clears throat> the material safety data sheet is something we're probably more likely in a smaller scale setting to run into. <coughs> you can see an example of this on 1051 in your textbook. Um, I've been told by some of my contacts that um, work in hazardous materials that MSDS sheets are undergoing basically a global revision. So they're looking at a, a new uniform and a new standard for these MSDS sheets to um, help standardize everything, make sure that all the appropriate information is there. So the MSDS is detailed information about these chemicals, the properties, their physical states, their health risks. It actually takes much of the information from the emergency response guide and then actually add some additional information. It is very possible that you actually get an emergency, or I'm sorry, an MSDS sheet if you have to take your ambulance out to get oxygen somewhere. They probably give you an MSDS every time you get a new bottle of oxygen. Um, so take a look at it the next time. Um, also, if you get cases of chemicals, maybe you have a very specific uh, disinfectant you use, there's probably an MSDS in there. By rights, uh, and by law, actually, um, if you have a hazardous chemical in your facility um, or your property, you must have the MSDS available for you. And it needs to be easily available, so it can't be locked up in the director's office. It has to be something that can be immediately gotten a hold of should there be an incident. So say somebody's trying to disinfect the squad, they get some of this chemical in their eye, in their mouth, they inhale it, whatever. Uh, and they need to be treated, they should know where they can go find that data sheet, um, find the, the book, uh, binder, what have you, um, so they can get all the information necessary and take it with them to the hospital to be treated. Now additional information you may get on a hazmat. Shipping papers, whether we're talking cargo manifest, bills of lading, whatever, that declare the content on board the transport container, um, truckers, um, ship captains, so on and so forth, 
they have these shipping papers that tells you what is it that you got, what's there, what do we got to be concerned with. There's also lots of other potential sources of information, such as uh, the Chemical Transportation Emergency Center, Chemtrack, there's Chemtel. These are specialists. Um, basically, they're major poison control centers for hazardous materials uh, that can be gotten uh, hold of 24 hours a day should there be an incident. <laughs> and of course, we have the Poison Control Center. Talked about that basically from um, uh, the uh, toxic emergency section of this uh, course. <clears throat> so, avoiding hazardous materials. <clears throat> Hazmat scenes may not be safe to enter for hours. Again, I encourage you to remember these can be very, very long term incidents. <clears throat> the hazmat team is going to enter. They will decontaminate the patient and bring them to us in the cold zone. You need to do whatever you can to avoid the hazard, <coughs> to avoid the contaminated victims, and avoid the outside um, if, unless you are working in the safe or cold zone. Um, if people start just coming to you, um, you need to direct them to become how to get decontaminated. They haven't been decontaminated. They haven't gone through the process. They're walking out of the cornfield, whatever. Um, you're going to have to divert them um, and avoid outside. So when they say this, they say stay in your vehicle, roll up the windows, recirculate cabin air. Um, this is all additional ways to protect yourself. None of it is perfect, but if something would happen and the, and the situation becomes bigger or worse, um, you're there. You're inside. You're ready to roll. Um, if you, um, you know, get a, a moment of heads up, you can get the heck out of there. <clears throat> so this shows you the hot, warm, and cold zone system that we typically like to use in a hazmat situation. Uh, this is on uh, 1053 in your text. Uh, the hot zone or the exclusion zone. This is where the incident is actually occurring. So. Only those that are properly equipped and trained can be in here. <coughs> the warm zone is the decontamination zone, sometimes called the control zone. Um, so this is where they, the patients are brought out of the hot zone. They're going to start the decontamination process here. Usually that there's a, a, an access corridor that people can, that are restricted from entry and, and exiting except only through a couple of areas. Um, and that decontamination line provides that orderly movement to get them out of the hot zone. We de de decrap them, we clean them up, and these people also will have appropriate protective gear on, possibly not as to the level of those in the hot zone. Some emergency care may be provided there. So if you're on a specialty hazmat response medical team, Perhaps you would be working in that zone. Um, and then the cold zone or the safe zone. This is after people have been decontaminated. Um, and uh, the further and final decontaminations are going to occur here prior to their transport. All right, so isolating the hazardous material. <laughs> Public safety. Um, becomes our, a huge concern. We want to prevent additional casualties. We want to prevent the spread of the contamination. So that might include um, letting people know either uphill, downhill, upwind, down, uh, well not downwind, um, uh, upstream of a specific hazard. Um, so we want to make sure that people are not going to be in the flow of the hazard. So hazardous materials teams establish those three zones. <laughs> So again, re recaps what I just mentioned. Um, and then notify uh, the responders of the hazmat incident. So determine the re resources to be dispatched. Usually this is going to be under direction of uh, the fire officer uh, because they're going to know what their fire capabilities are. Relay any additional information. Let the hospitals know what to potentially expect. Um, particularly in situations we may have an oddball uh, exposure, uh, letting the hospital know as soon as possible can get them prepared. Uh, there are things called strategic stockpiles that are found 
uh, regionally, really throughout all the different states that have specific antidotes and specific additional equipment to handle things like this. So as much heads up as possible that the hospital can have, they can perhaps activate their plans, get a hold of their strategic stock stockpile, and get the appropriate equipment and medications uh, coming. <clears throat> Secondary contamination, any patient who's been in contact with a hazmat as a potential to contaminate the responders. <clears throat> there is the po potential and the possibility that if the patient didn't get fully decontaminated, that you too become contaminated. And you may also have to undergo a decontamination process. Um, most hospitals, actually I think all hospitals, have a plan uh, of how they would decontaminate patients should they have to, uh, should they roll in and have a major incident. Um, certain parts of uh, western Iowa are within a specific um, contingency plan should there be a nuclear disaster um, at, uh, at the nuclear power plant uh, just north of the Omaha metro area. So there's various zones and regions. So um, a lot of times there are very specific uh, plans already in place. Hospitals are supposed to practice these at least once per year. Remember, many, many substances do not have a specific antidote. So you have to be cognizant of that. You have to be careful. <coughs> All right. You, your ambulance, your hospital employees can be considered contaminated. Any patient in contact with hazmat, even if decontaminated, can contaminate the, re the responders. So it, this is something that we have to be very cognizant of, we have to be very cautious of, and even if we need to put up an extra step in the decon process, um, we have to keep that in mind. Because remember, we roll these people into a hospital, we probably have a whole bunch of people in that hospital that want contaminated, so we start rolling this, this uh, injured or ill person through x-ray and lab and the emergency room, and they get admitted to the medical surgical floor, um, we're just spreading that contamination everywhere. <clears throat> it's known as secondary contamination. Hospital emergency departments can be closed if contamination from a scene reaches the patient care area. And that's going to make things a big mess. So the OSHA training levels, we have first responder awareness and first responder operations. Most departments are requiring operations these days. Operations is about, I believe, a 24-hour course, if I remember right. Um, and it's basically identifying and isolating, um, potentially doing some of the uh, um, decon. Uh, then there's a hazardous materials operations, hazardous materials technician, and hazardous materials specialist. Um, and each step um, gains more responsibilities, whether they're they're doing things to <coughs> Doing things to decontaminate, stop um, stop the flow, stop the spread, um, or cleaning up the process or the incident. Uh, OSHA requires the use of ICS during an incident command, or I'm sorry, during a hazmat uh, incident. Again, I will re remind you um, that you need to have uh, ICS 100 and 700 at a bare minimum uh, to appropriate to be appropriately cleared to uh, uh, take the National Registry at the next level. Uh, it is, uh, if your department is ever wanting to apply for grants, FEMA watches this very closely uh, and Homeland Security watches it very closely to make sure that um, X amount of people on that department have received this training. <coughs> PPE, uh, that is going to be uh, determined by nature of the incident. <coughs> so it usually involves respiratory protection, things as such as a, an SCBA or maybe a PAPR, um, uh, special garments, various barriers, uh, and different types of, of barrier devices depending on the type of, of exposure, whether it's biological, chemical, radioactive. 
All right, in order for you to use this personal protective equipment, you need to be trained in the use of the special equipment. Um, the various levels, level A, this is a fully encapsulated suit uh, supplied, uh, uh, air supplied by SCBA. So you have a very limited source. Um, if you take a look at, say, page, uh, let's see, 1059, I think it's also this, on uh, the beginning page of this chapter as well, so which would be, yeah, 1045. Either one is showing some level A protection. They're fully encapsulated suits. Those guys have SCBAs on. <clears throat> uh, level B suits. Uh, level B suits, these are not fully encapsulated, but the responder still uses SCBA. It offers good splash protection. Level C <clears throat> does not necessarily include an SCBA, but it does have a respirator mask with a filter and suit. So this would be something like they refer to the PAP. And level D is regular firefighter turnout care. So, all right, decon, uh, this must occur whenever hazardous materials contaminate a patient or equipment. Remember, putting this patient into your ambulance can potentially ha uh, contaminate everything you've got in that truck. So, um, we work to remove their contaminated clothing. A lot of times they end up with paper gowns for transport or paper scrubs for transport to the hospital. Generally, uh, it involves using copious amounts of water, and in many cases, soap, um, to remove the contaminants from the skin. Generally, the recommendation also is cold water. Um, cold water because it shrinks the pores. So when you're cold, you're not tending to sweat, right? So it shrinks your pores, and it gives less of a chance that it gets actually sucked in or absorbed into the skin. Whereas if you used hot water, that hot water would make you start to sweat, it would open up all your pores, and give more entrances for the chemical to get into your body. Um, primary contamination is directly from the source itself within the hot zone. The secondary comes from outside the hot zone, and this is indirect. So your patient comes walking out of the hot zone, didn't get properly decontaminated, comes up to you, uh, climbs into your ambulance, and now you have a secondary decontamination. I'm sorry, secondary contamination. Uh, hazardous materials responses always have unpredictable elements. We don't know how long we're going to be there, and a lot of times we don't even know what we're dealing with to begin with. So, triage is very possible uh, that we're going to have to perform a triage system, um, assess them, manage them, transport them as, as necessary using the uh, incident command system <coughs> and the appropriate mass casualty. Um, training that you guys have received. Um, they may still have decontam they may still have contamination, so be prepared to uh, decontaminate them further. A lot of times they'll have another uh, decontamination set up at the hospital, like I mentioned. Uh, the risk of retained contaminants is higher in patients who are unconscious or incapacitated. They don't tend to get scrubbed as quickly. I'm sorry, they don't tend to get scrubbed as thoroughly. And it's uh, usually a little bit quicker of a process because they're understanding that this person is, is ill and we need to get them some assistance. Rehab. So rehab, uh, this is an area set up to assess and treat the responders. So a lot of times we're also, uh, the, the thing we do the most rehab on is, is firefighter rehab when we're on the scene of a, a working fire. So things such as the temperature, uh, direct sunlight, humidity, uh, long hours, uh, people not getting appropriate rest, not getting appropriate uh, nourishment, uh, all these can take their toll. Um, dehydration is huge in these incidents. So, uh, OSHA requires hazmat entry teams have their vital signs taken before entering the hot zone and upon leaving it. So there's medical monitoring that goes on with these hazmat incidents. Um, and in, in a lot of situations, there is a, a yearly or, or bi-yearly, um, I should say semi-annual, um, assessment of all of the personnel on the department that helps to give a baseline. Uh, and that baseline um, gets used down the road should there be an incident. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, here's Joe. He's been exposed. Here's his vital signs. Uh, now, but we don't always know what your vital signs typically are or normally are. 
So it gives us that information to um, draw a baseline. <coughs> Contamination directly from the source is primary. It occurs in the hot zone, most likely at the time of the release, before the isolation is established. <coughs> And most primary contamination is from solids or liquids. All right. <coughs> now to get to a little bit more on the medical side of things here, when we're talking um, <clears throat> hazmat. So a toxicant, a toxicant is a poisonous substance that is not derived from the metabolism of an organism. So inhalation is the most common way that hazmat uh, gets into our body. An acute exposure is an abrupt high-dose single exposure as opposed to a chronic exposure where we have a longer-term uh, low-level substance. So when you hear about people that are exposed to radon, radon is not something that, that affects people uh, two seconds after they come into contact with it. Uh, it's something that slowly seeps out of the ground um, and can poison people over long periods of time. So that would be more likely to be a, a chronic exposure from a, <coughs> yes, it, it in a sense is a hazardous materials incident, but it's not a classic one that you would, would think about. So patients need to be prioritized for treatment and transport using our triage system. We still use the same, um, the same uh, triage. Um, system that we would for most uh, medical patients and, and trauma patients. Um, and as the patient leaves a decon area, we're going to perform our primary and our secondary assessments. We're going to intervene to treat immediately any life-threatening problems with ABCs. Uh, patient injuries may include things such as blast trauma, thermal burns, chemical burns. They may have other injuries. If it was, say, maybe it was a crash. Uh, that semi rollover. Uh, so we have a semi rollover <coughs> in which the patients suffered some uh, traumatic injuries, but now also on top of it, uh, we'll have a uh, um, contamination. Hazard in incidents can be very frightening and emotionally traumatizing. Most people understand that there's a, a significant risk, uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, Hazardous material scenes can quickly turn into chaos, they become very unstable, have crowds that are going nuts. Um, so special considerations in radiation. Uh, trefoil, this is the sources of radiation identified uh, with a universal symbol for radiation, which is the three-bladed icon, or uh, I like to think of it as a fan blade. It looks like a three-bladed uh, little fan. Uh, in exposure, radiation uh, energy comes in contact with the body, that's exposure. Now, uh, when we talk about that, um, know that you're exposed to radiation every day, particularly if you um, are uh, out in the sun. Uh, you get That's radiation exposure. Uh, contamination, <laughs> these are particles that emit radiation that are on the person or their body. So if they're covered, let's say they're covered in something like um, radium or uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other uh, major um, sources of radiation, uranium. Um, so a person who's contaminated with radioactive material can contaminate anything that he comes into contact with. Radiation is the energy in the form of electromagnetic waves or subatomic particles. It is invisible and undetectable without special equipment. <coughs> and we most commonly think of Geiger counters as being able to detect those things. Um, particulate radiation includes alpha and beta particles and neutron radiation. Um, electromagnetic ionizing radiation forms are gamma rays and x-rays. The good thing about um, things like alpha uh, alpha waves, alpha radiation. Uh, alpha radiation can be stopped by a piece of paper. Um, so it, it's actually really pretty low risk uh, when we're talking about alpha radiation. Beta, uh, beta, you know, something just a little bit thicker than paper, say uh, some standard, uh, uh, you know, 
clothing may be enough to shield you from it. Um, in most cases, you know, something just even like a, a regular wall will do a fine job of, of um, protecting you from beta particles. Gamma particles and x-rays though, you're talking you need things such as lead. Uh, so gamma radiation uh, can radiate several hundred feet from its source and easily penetrate your skin. So usually time, distance, and shielding is important. Uh, X-rays, if you're going to, uh, to be assisting in uh, radiology at some of the hospitals, they'll usually give you a lead-lined apron to wear to protect yourself. So again, alpha particles, a range of 1 to 2 inches, beta, roughly 10 feet, gamma, uh, hundreds of feet, um, and then protection, time, distance, and shield. So, uh, all of those things help reduce the risk. <coughs> Neutron energy has the longest range, several hundred feet or farther. And the three major factors uh, that affect uh, the biologic damage, total dose, dose rate, and the type of radiation that uh, caused the exposure. So there's several different factors that, that come into play here. So um, people that work around uh, radiation have to be monitored. They usually wear a little badge. Their badge has to be frequently um, assessed to see just how much um, radiation they've been exposed to over a certain amount of time. Sometimes people that have had a, uh, a higher than, than safe um, exposure, particularly say x-ray technicians, uh, they may be um, banned from going in to do certain types of x-rays for a certain amount of time to allow their body to, uh, to allow that radiation to, uh, to then basically thin out and uh, not, not be continuously building. So. <coughs> So the radiation absorbed dose is known as RAD, and then the, the Rankin equivalent, uh, man, uh, this is the amount of radiation and the likely biologic damage to occur. So when they're looking um, at that, they're really saying, um, here's what we think the level of the incident is, and it's REM, and uh, the RAD is, is really what they're, they're looking at as when they check your badge, they're looking at your RADs. So, <clears throat> Radiation sickness requires a dose of roughly 100,000 um, millirems, and severe symptoms require a dose of, of over 250,000 millirems. Acute radiation sickness uh, has really four phases, prodromal latent illness, uh, and recovery or death, <laughs> and the prodromal stage is when you see things such as nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, diarrhea. It's kind of, kind of the, uh, <coughs> kind of the the precursors there. The latent period is usually shorter than the prodromal phase, where it kind of starts to build, uh, kind of starts to take longer effects. The illness stage. These are when you start to see recurrence of different signs and symptoms, potentially even seeing things now, things like loss, weight loss and hair loss and so on and so forth. Recovery or death can occur for weeks to months following. Radiation injury or the localized radiation injury, it's partial body exposure, people who work around or with radioactive substances, so scientists, x-ray technicians, so on and so forth. Uh, the integumentary system is a good indicator of the LRI, so any patient who has been contaminated with a radioactive substance must be contaminated before receiving emergency medical care. A lot of times they show signs of burns, so uh, they're starting to show things, uh, redness and blistering. In extremely high doses, signs or symptoms of radiation injury and sickness are delayed. Um, if, if the patient's been exposed, they really need to be evaluated. Patients with internal radiation contamination uh, are going to require immediate hospitalization. There are some sorts of antidotes for various types of radiations. Facilities need to be notified that they're going to receive an irradiated patient. Some people 
get radiation therapy actually from an implant. Um, and I think uh, the most common one I hear of is people with bladder cancer. They will get implanted with a radiation pellet that actually gives them radiation from the inside, um, you know, basically trying to go towards the outside. Um, but if we would have somebody who ate something, um, that then they would have the radiation on the inside. <clears throat> All right, so while hazmat incidents or events uh, can be unpredictable, the RAIN process gives us a consistent step-by-step -step framework to use on these scenes. Take the time to learn about the hazmats uh, that, uh, that you may encounter, the resources available, look them over, identify and protect yourself. Use the emergency response guidebook, MSDS sheets, telephone and internet resources to help you anticipate signs and symptoms and to start to develop a treatment plan for your decon, uh, to decon, for your patients that have been decontaminated and need transport. Your personal safety is the most important consideration. Assume every chemical poses health and safety risk towards you um, and including the risk of death.